ಸಮಾಪ್ಯಾಯೇಂದುಮಾಂಗಾನಿ ವಾಗ್ಪ್ರಾಣಶ್ಚಕ್ಷುಸ್ರೋತ್ರಮಥೋ ಬಲಮಿಂದ್ರಿಯಾಣಿ ಚರ್ವಾಣಿ ಸರ್ವ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮೋಪನಿಷದ ಮಾಂ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನಿರಾಕುರ್ಯಾಂ ಮಾಮಾ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನಿರಾಕರೋತ್ ಅನಿರಾಕರಣಮಸ್ತು ಅನಿರಾಕರಣ ಮೇ ಅಸ್ತು ತದಾತ್ಮನಿ ನಿರತೀಯ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ಸು ಧರ್ಮಸ್ತೆ ಮಯಿ ಸಂತು ತೇ ಮಯಿ ಸಂತು may my limbs speech vital force eyes ears and as also strength in all the organs become well developed everything is the brahman revealed in the upanishads may I not deny brahman may not brahman deny me let there be no spurning of me by brahman let there be no rejection of the absolute reality by me me all the virtues that are spoken of in the upanishads and scriptures repose in me who am engaged in the pursuit of the absolute reality the self may they repose in me om peace 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 no in the last few classes we were Dis- discussing some of the essential points of vedanta first the upanishad said that everything that we experience in the waking dream and deep sleep stage is one reality atman self brahman turiya such terms are used these are different terms we denote the same reality which cannot be denoted by any word so these are all words used by the upanishads to describe the absolute reality which actually is beyond description now in the upanishads there is a special approach which we we must keep in mind now it is called adhyaropa apavada prakriya a particular method approach employed to analyze metaphysically the absolute reality <coughs> say highly um, acclaimed a celebrated approach and uh, let let's to uh, take the upanishads in the first few mantras that we dealt with in the beginning the upanishad said sarvam hi etad brahma everything is brahman om iti devaksharam sarvam so everything that we experience trikala adhinam trikala atidam that which is within the time space and causation that which is within the sphere of our empirical experience that we experience in waking state in dream and also deep sleep state within time within time space and causation that is absolute brahman that is the supreme reality and what lies beyond beyond the time space and causation beyond the empirical that also is brahman after all you cannot have anything more that which is within time space and causation and that which is beyond time space and causation bo all these constitute the supreme reality the second mantra the upanishad teaches that that reality which is within time space and causation and which is beyond time space and causation and which includes all that we can see hear smell touch of think of or contemplate on the reality which is the source of the creation which sustains the creation and which again is the point of dissolution of the universe just like clay from which a pot is made before the pot was made it was clay and after the pot is broken it will be clay then there is no doubt that when the pot is sitting in front of you with the name and form of pot that is also clay the second mantra the upanishad said that reality is within you 
everything that we experience outside the source of the universe is one reality and that reality i am atma brahma the great statement of this upanishad i am this atma that is brahman within you all that we see in this world in all all these beings there is an indweller what's called antaryami the in the indweller the one which dwells within that is the same brahman now one may very well ask the question why can't the upanishad make a straightforward statement there is only one reality that is brahman then there is no need of any contemplation so there is there perhaps there is no need of so many upanishad so many scriptures one reality is one that's enough but people won't understand it and that sentence won't make any sense to anybody you know the reason because we all all people generally who live in this world who uh, experience this world of which they are all parts are fully convinced that reality is more than one and they are also convinced that all that they see and experience this world of plurality this uh, experience of plurality is real and when you tell them that this all this this these things which uh, cons- the all which we experience and see and live in they are actually only they only constitute one reality actually they are only one reality nobody will understand so the upanishads have to come down to the level of the common man which we include all of us of course and explain to them see look at the world that you see and experience in the beginning we think that uh, one entity call it god or anybody the supreme intelligence or anything he created this world and uh, this world and its creator are two different things this is the most uh, common place understanding of philosophy and they believe that this world of plurality alone is real if you talk about one reality which is immanent and transcendent and omnipresent people won't understand so the upanishads have to come down to the level of the common man and talk to them well you are right the world is pluralistic manifold but you look at the world that you see a common man you know you ask him he would say that dream experience is different from waking experience and entirely different from deep sleep experience this is what a co- what anybody will understand this is the common sense experience of people who don't take much interest in philosophy so the upanishads have to come down to their level and take them and lift them slowly stage by stage to the nearest level of philosophical contemplation so first the upanishad tells us well world is manifold it is pluralistic all these things are different entities but then he try to understand the so called pluralistic manifold world and then the upanishad tells us well when you understand it you feel actually it is only one reality in other upanishads the approach is this i mean this approach is uh, slightly different the ekthaitiri upanishad as i quoted earlier and many other upanishads will tell you that reality wanted to create this world let let me become many and it became many so the reality a god whom were you may call it maybe personal god let us stick for argument sake a personal god saka akamayeda bhukusyam prajayeti God wanted that we become many. 
So he himself became many. It's just like a pot maker says, well, let me become a pot. It doesn't happen in my empirical world. But if it happens, then you have to admit that the efficient cause and material cause are the same. So here, uh, the Taitiri Omanisha tells us, he willed, let me become many, and he became many, and then he endured the world which he created, the many things which he created. And after entering these things, he became one with it. God created this world. He became, he himself became this world rather. He didn't create, he himself became this world. And then he uh, endured this world and he became one with this world. Which means the world really doesn't exist independent of its creator. Creation and creator are one. Now, this is the approach in Taitiriya. But here, the approach is based on our experiences of the three states of waking, dream, and uh, uh, deep sleep state. So, first, in the last mantra, we already exp explained that in, that in waking state, uh, we have 19... Uh, 19 doors, 19 instruments with which we react, we interact with the external world in waking states. The five senses of perception, five senses of action, then five elements, and then uh, mana, buddhi, chitta, and ahankara. Mind, intellect, the storehouse of impressions, that is citta, and the consciousness, I, the a, a sense of agency or doership. These constitute 19 ekona vimshati mukha. The reality, the absolute reality, with experiences, the external objects in waking state, has got 19 doors or mouths with which it experiences or interacts with the external world in waking state. And also, seven, then saptangaha, seven limbs, head, eyes, face, middle part of the body, then bladder, feet. In this way, it has got seven limbs. There are these seven limbs and 19 parts with which it interacts with the external world. And here the reality is called Vishwa. And in, as the individual experiences called Vishwa, totality of individual experiences is called Vaishwanarha or Virat. That means the totality of all the experiences in waking state of all living beings Together is called Virat. Virat means this visible world, this empirical world, the phenomenal world that we experience in waking states. And this is called the cosmic level, maybe macro level. At the micro level, at the individual level, the experiencer is called Vishwa in the technical language of this Upanishad. Now, then in dream state, the individual experiencer is called Taijasaha. Taijasaha, I mean, there is, a, there is a special significance with the sense. We are going to deal with that. See, in dream state, the only instrument with which we experience dream objects is our own mind. Because... All the impressions we gather in waking state are stored up. And because of avidya, karma and karma, these impressions are projected to the surface. And then we experience these objects in dream state. Here I should explain avidya, karma and karma. The Upanishads will later will explain this. Not this stage, but this stage. Next stage. Avidya, Kama, and Karma. These three factors are responsible for 
or external experiences, not only in dream state but also in uh, waking state experience. See, avidya means ignorance, karma means desire, karma means action. Now, the Upanishad tells us, because of avidya, karma and karma, we store the impressions of waking state in chitta. And in dream, uh, these impressions take the form of visible experiences. Avidya means ignorance. Ignorance means, we can say, uh, absence of knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge that we are Atman, the Self, without the seconds, which is not an experiencer of these empirical experiences, but a one reality, the supreme witness, which never experiences anything, and which is the same in, ja in waking state, dream state, and deep sleep state. This is the knowledge. Absence of this knowledge is called avidya. Now, when we are, if we are ignorant of our own real nature, we will have desire. All desires are rooted in ignorance of our true nature. If we become aware of our true nature, we will have no desire. And if we have no desire, we will have no grief. And if there is no desire, there is be no greed also. No attachment. So all attachments, see everything that's it. In modern industrial world, we can very easily see. Uh, desire is at the root of all the problems. There is not a single problem that a modern industrialized, urbanized world is facing which is not caused by desire. A rich man wants to become more rich, a powerful man become, wants to become more powerful, and it goes on. In the Mahabharata it says, you know, if, you, if the fire of desire is blazing, you can't put out the fire by pouring more and more ghee. The fire will become all the more blazing, it becomes all the more uncontrollable. So the more we try to achieve things, acquire things, enjoy things, the more en desire for enjoyments increase. This is, and this is at the root of all the problems that the modern man is facing today. See, Ramakrishna puts this in his own unique style in the gospel. Right now, we will go, go to that. Why? We have all this desire because we think we are the one who is going to enjoy these things and we are the one who is going to uh, become happy by enjoying these things because we think we are just a bundle of mind, body and senses psychophysical mechanism. So we want many things we want to enjoy. And as a result of this desire, we uh, get engaged in different activities, karma. So avidya, absence of our real nature, that leads to uh, desire for enjoyments and Desire for enjoyments, uh, the greed compels us to be engaged in all kinds of activities which create competition, psychological problems, problems of anxiety, neurosis, and so on. I won't go list them one after another. No need. Now, the Upanishad tells us if you get yourself engaged in any action, if you do anything, with a desire, that uh, action will uh, register in your mind. It's called chittam. You know, here in chittam, perhaps we cannot have a tra proper translation into English. Chittam, let us, if you try to understand, chittam is that, that part of our mental mechanism where we store impressions of past actions. A storehouse of impressions. That's what Chittam is. So, whatever we do, we desire 
and desire will create a kind of attachment and identification. I am the one who is doing these things and I am the one who, who is going to enjoy the results of my actions. So agentship and also enjoyership. Kartruttum bhogtruttum in Sanskrit is called. The feeling that I am the one who is doing this work. And therefore I am the one who is going to enjoy the results of this work. This is invariable when you do anything with desire. Any action for the matter. Now whatever we do with desire and identification. That I am doing this. I want to enjoy this. It will create an impression in Chittam. And then what happens? If it is an unpleasant, if the result of our action is unpleasant, we try to avoid this in future. If the result is pleasant, we would like to repeat it even if it is not necessary. So that's called in Sanskrit we call Raga and Dvesha. Attachment means the desire to repeat action which brings pleasant results, happy results, and to avoid it if it brings unhappy results. Now what happens? Whatever we do in waking state with a strong sense of identification, guided and controlled and uh, prompted by desire, will leave its impression in mind, in chittam. I would use the word mind here because chittam is a technical term which may not be, everyone may not be familiar with. And then what happens? Sometime in future, we will have a tendency to do similar action. And similarly, in dream, we may repeat, relieve, and re-experience this action. Why? Because impression is created in the in the reservoir of impressions, the storehouse of impressions, that is called chittam, mind as they call it. In, in the storehouse of impressions, our action has already created, has left an impression, and that will come to the surface in three. If you do things without any sense of attachment, without any sense of identification that we are doing it, then it will not leave any impression. See, if suppose you're walking through San Francisco streets. On the way you may see trees, human beings, cars, vehicles parked, maybe passing through the streets. You don't notice them. So they don't leave any particular impression in your mind. You, your eyes are watching them, but your mind is not there. And you don't, you may, or if you are walking through a village road, you may see pebbles, stones, leaves, grass, and so on. We don't, they won't leave any impression in our mind. But suppose a snake or a dog chases you, God forbid it ever happens. But suppose it ever happens, and you run, and unfortunately something happens to you, an accident, you may break your... Neck, I don't say it will ever happen. Suppose it happens, <laughs> then you will not forget it because that experience has left an impression in your chittam. And that night, you may again re experience the same. You may be running and the dog chasing, and you, you, you have something happening to your body. It can happen after 10 years. It can happen after 20 years. Why? Because the action has left its impression in mind. So you may relieve that impression. It need not go, go to sleep for that. Even when you close your eyes, it can happen. But in dream, it happens with special force. When I was taking this class, you know, some time back, somebody raised a question. He said that he sometimes gets some dreams which can never be related to any of his waking state experiences in this life. Well, Vedanta will tell you it may be related to some of his experiences in previous life. That's Vedanta tells you. We have, you know, we, we our, in our character, uh, there are certain things that we can't help doing in a special way, in a particular way. 
से इन संस्कृत इट इज कॉल्ड अनुसुद स्वभाव मीन्स इनहेरिटेड नॉट अक्वायर्ड बट इनहेरिटेड इनएक्सप्लेकेबल कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स विच वी खान एक्सप्लेन इन टर्म्स ऑफ आवर एक्सपीरियंसेस इन दिस लाइफ इट कैन हैपन सो वेदांत वुड टेल यू दोस एक्सपीरियंसेस मे बी related to your previous life if you read the works of edgar casey and other parapsychologists they they explain this very elaborately all of them all those explanations may not be taken seriously but there is a lot of truth in what those parapsychologists uh, try to describe now main difference is this whatever we experience in this life which has left its impression in our mind when we re-experience in dream we see we experience it with name and form whatever is related to in this life when we re-experience in dream we experience it with name and form if you are if you are seen a strange animal 10 years back and when you see that same animal the name of the animal if it has got a name and its form also will be visible but if it is related to previous life name and form will not be visible they will come in the form of abstract ideas without name and form because names and forms were experienced by panchajnanendriyas mind etc those belong to previous life they have vanished but this chittam it is called antakarana antakarana has got four components mana buddhi chitta and ahankara chittam store, uh, stores all these impressions like a bundle it continues to be handed over from generation to generation till that jiva that that individual realizes that i am not antakarana i am not chittam i am not buddhi i am not any of these things i am the atman the moment he realizes this truth he gets out of this cycle he breaks the chains and becomes liberated so now now we will come to the upanishad this point should be understood now the point one more point to be explained now upanishad tells us the same thriya he is a witness he is the experiencer in waking state at vishwa and it is the experiencer in dream state as taijasa and the totality of dream experiences the macro form is called hiranyagarbha in the language of this upanishad so the totality of waking state experiences is called virar virar mean this this gross visible external empirical phenomenon phenomenal world hiranyagarbha is nothing but its subtle form its subtle form because in dream everything is subtle now in susupti state also as i said earlier the same witness the same experiencer continues to exist and all names and forms vanish in is or in deep sleep state there is no confusion there is just one experience which is completely free from all anxieties all worries all frictions all pluralities so there is an experience of bliss but that experience is not with awareness that experience is devoid of awareness in susupti or deep sleep when the same experience is experienced with awareness it is called samadhi and that is possible only when an aspirant consciously tries to evolve himself spiritually in spiritual life either through 
jnana or bhakti or karma yoga or any of these paths. Now we'll come to the Upanishad proper. I think these ideas are already clear. Now today, after around 8.15, I shall uh, uh, try to answer some of your questions. There was a suggestion, it came in printed form, that uh, after a few classes, uh, I would give you an opportunity to raise questions and I would like to reply, I would like to clarify your points if I got any doubts after about three minutes. <coughs> because we will have no classes for some time for the next, I shall, I shall make the announcement later at the end of this class. <coughs> now we will come to the third mantra, that's what we are to dealing with, we are, we are to deal with today. Jagarida sthanu bhikish praknyaha saptankaha ekona vimshadi mukha sthula bhuk vaishwana raha prathama padaha. They already we have explained, I think, this we have already dealt with last time. That is Jagarida sthana, that Turiya or Atman which is located uh, in in the, in, in the aspirant as a witness within which experiences external objects which is oriented towards external things which has got seven limbs all that we have already explained the seven limbs have we already seen that is its head eye, breath middle part of the body kidney, feet and face. At the, ma at the macro level, that reality that we round, the cosmic person, let us say the cosmic person, the absolute reality described as the omnipresent cosmic person who is uh, all pervading. His head is the effulgen region, effulgen region, celestial region about the sky. And his eye is the sun. And his breath is the air. And his middle part of the body is ether. And his kidney is water. And his feet is the earth. And his mouth is fire. Now remember, we, it, we have not covered the whole of this uh, individual person. Every individual has got these seven saptanga, seven limbs. In a symbolic way, seven limbs of an, of an average individual is taken. And then, what should be these seven limbs of the cosmic person? Because, as I said last time, Macrocosm and microcosm are the same. They are built on the same plan. What is in the cosmic, the micro person, is there in the, macro, in the microcosm and also in the individual. What is in microcosm is there in macrocosm as well. They are both the same. So, in the, in the individual self, in the microcosm, we can find head, eye, breath, uh, middle part of the body, kidney, feet, face, etc. So these seven uh, limbs, which are which one can find in any living human being, are explained as parts of the cosmic person in the language in the proportion of the entire cosmic phenomena. So the celestial region is the head, the air is the breath, and sun is the eye, and so on. Now again, it's called saptang ekona vimsadi mukhaka. That at the micro level, the individual level, every living being has got 19 mouths. 
mouth, the word mouth is used in, in a technical symbolic way because it is through mouth that we eat food and enjoy food. Sthu, here is thula bhuk, it is said, that one which experiences external things, external gross objects. Sthula means gross. So, the external gross objects are enjoyed by this uh, mic at the micro level by this individual person through 19 parts. 19 parts are explained. Uh, only last we have explained five senses of perception, five senses of action, then five elements, then mana, buddhi, chitta, and ahankara. We already explained all this. Sthula bhuk, vaishwanaraka. I said the, at the macro level is called Vaishwana. Prathama Padaka is the first quarter of this Atman Turiya. First quarter, we have to understand, it's the first, maybe first foot or first limb or first quarter, it may be explained many translations. The idea should be understood. It is called Prathama Pada, first one, because it is related to waking state. And our first experience level is waking state. Dream is based on waking state experiences. And both vanish and get submerged in Sushupti. Later, the Upanishad will tell you, Sushupti or deep sleep is the cause, the origin of both waking and, state exp and dream experiences. The Upanishad will tell you later. Because what happens... Whatever we experience in waking state and dream state get dissolved in Sushupti. In Sushupti there is no duality. Any experience of duality will create anxiety and other problems. So all the experiences, all the all the experiences of duality get completely submerged in deep sleep state. And again, they re-emerge from deep sleep state. In deep sleep, there is the ignorance, there, there is ignorance of everything. In waking and dream state, there is not only ignorance, but there is also the problem of mistaking one for the other. In dream and waking state, we are not able to understand our real sudupa. So we experience name and form, this empirical phenomena, and we think they are real because the reality is covered, concealed. And not only concealed, there is not only concealment, there is also superimposition of duality. So in dream and waking state, our surupa is concealed, it is veiled. And not only that, something else is projected. You are not only able, you are not only not able to see the rope, but you see the snake in place of rope in dream and waking state. In deep sleep, we don't see anything. We don't see either snake or rope because there is pitch darkness. That's what the Upanishad is going to explain when it explains the Sushupti state, the Prajna state. In Sanskrit, it's called Agrahanam and Nyanyatha Grahanam. Agrahanam means absence of perception. Anyatha Grahanam means perception or recognition of something else in place of the reality. So in waking and dream state, we experience everything other than our self. We are convinced that world alone is real. That's, that's our normal understanding of any man living at the level of ignorance. World is real. We don't, world is, we don't know, we don't, uh, see Brahman, that is true. Agrahanam is there. And along with that, we also see the world in place of Brahman. 
So anyatha grahana means perceiving, cognizing something else in place of the real. But in deep sleep state or susupti state, there is no perception of something in place of the reality. There is only the absence of perception of the supreme reality. There is only concealment. There is only avarana, not vikshaba. That is the Sanskrit language. Vikshaba means projecting something else in place of the real. Avarana means complete concealment of the reality. So, the Upanishad will explain later that Susupti state is actually the causal form that we will explain when that particular mantra is dealt with. So, Sthula Bhuk Vaishwanaraka Prathama Padaka. Now, next mantra. It deals with the Taijasa or the experiencer in dream state. Sopna sthano anta praknyaka. Saptankaka ekona vimsadi mukha. Pravivikta bhuk taijaso ditiya padaka. Now, there is a lot of similarity between the experiencer in waking state and the experiencer in dream state. See, the only difference is Jagrida sthano bhish praknyaka. In Jagra state, our prajna is outside. Our sphere of activity is outside. But in Supna state, that is the second quarter, that is called Taijasa, sphere of activity is internal. And the experiencer in dream state is conscious of only internal objects. All the indriyas are present in Sopna state also, as I said earlier. S Saptangaha, seven limbs we already explained in the third mantra, they are also present for the dreamer because if you ask the dreamer, the dreamer will tell you the dream reality is as real for the dreamer as the uh, waking state reality is real for the one in waking state. We understand that it is only dream object only when we return from dream state to waking state. We think of dream objects as subtle as the repetition of waking experiences only when we look at them from uh, waking state. For the dreamer Dream objects are as real as waking state experiences are real for the one in waking state. This is a very important point. So the dreamer will see things. All these five senses of perception, eyes, ears, etc. Five senses of action, five, then, then uh, five elements, mana, buddhi, chitta, ahankara, mind, intellect, storehouse of impressions, and also identification. All these things exist in dream also. There is no difference about it. For the dreamer, dream objects are as real as waking state experiences are real for the for one living in waking state. That's why, see, sopnasthanu antapraknyaka, saptangaka, head, Face, all these exist in dream state also. Ekona vimsadi mukha. We already explained five senses of perception, five senses of action, five elements, etc. All these exist in dream also. Only difference is internal. The eyes are closed. We are sleeping in, in a room which is pitch dark, in pitch darkness. Still we see, we hear. There is silence everywhere. Still, we can see with our eyes, we can see, we can hear with our ears, and we can smell, and we can taste food in dream. All these things are taking place. So, everything is the same. The only difference is, pravivikta bhuk means it is at a subtle level. 
because uh, external senses are absent rather external senses are absent only in an internal way external senses are absent in external way but they are present in an internal way in an internal level in dream state we see in dream state you can you, you will be walking through san francisco streets in dream eyes with eyes open but the eyes are closed you are dreaming in a dark room so you are seeing an internal way that's why it's called antaprajnaka sapnasthano antaprajnaka saptankah ekona vimshadi mukha pravivikta bhuk everything is projected by the mind pravivikta means manakalpitam that which is imagined projected by mind because you have experienced all this you have walked to san francisco where in in, in the middle of the uh, middle of the day with eyes open and you are walking through the same street when you are dreaming with eyes closed but you are seeing it why because mind has registered the impression of walking experience during waking state and that mind is projecting the same experience and then you experience it in the internal way that's only difference so taijasaha dvitiya padaha taijasaha means the teja means something light the light mean that which reveals light here need not necessarily mean uh what i mean the the light uh, the sunlight or electric light it means something which reveals everything is revealed through the impressions projected forward by the mind by the chittam chittam has already stored up memories gathered in waking state and now in dream they are projecting to the surface so we re experience we relive all those experiences dvitiya path this is the second path so first waking state first quarter second quarter is uh, dream state now we have a few minutes 15 minutes perhaps if you have got any uh, doubt we can ask in fact there was a long letter from one of our friends here who wanted me to answer some of your questions which you may like to put forward if there is anything to be discussed we'll do otherwise i shall continue the classes as usual Ah, yes. Excuse me once more. You said our third level of ah, yes. experience is the waking state. Does that mean that the waking state is closer to realization? Is our realization than the dream state or the deep sleep state? Yes. In fact, in waking waking state is the first from a an anal- analysis point of view. In fact, the Upanishad will tell you the source the cause of both waking and dream state are deep sleep state i shall here explain this though the subject will come later but i shall explain this at this point in deep sleep state there is only absence of true knowledge absence of true knowledge there is no projection of false i false objects because in deep sleep in susupti we don't see anything we don't experience anything we experience bliss but we are not aware of it while experiencing it we become aware of it when we come back to waking state so in deep sleep state there is only absence of knowledge not projection of false objects there is only avarana not vikshepa in sanskrit technical language in dream in dream and waking state there is concealment that is absence of the reality but also projection of wrong objects in dream and waking state we are not we are not able to experience the, our real swarupa real true nature but also in its place we see all the manifold objects and we think they are real so there is also there is not only concealment but there is also projection i hope it's true it's clear 
Now, what is the cause of projection? Why do you see the snake? Because you don't see the rope. Projection is caused by concealment. You are not able to see the rope as rope and you think it is snake because you are not able to see the rope. If you are able to see the rope, you won't see the snake. So what is the cause of anyatha grahanam or superimposition or projection of wrong objects? The cause of projection of wrong objects is concealment of the real objects. So concealment of the real object is a causal form, is a cause. I hope it's clear. Is the source. Because without concealment of the real object, there cannot be projection of the wrong objects. This ro the, the rope is hidden from you because there is not enough light. So you think it is snake. So, so concealment of the rope is the cause for seeing snake. Now, concealment or absence of knowledge of a real nature is the cause of projection of wrong objects. In dream and also in waking state, there is not only concealment, but there is also projection of wrong objects. That's very clear. But in, in Sushupti, in deep, deep sleep state, there is only concealment, avarana, not vikshepa. Therefore, deep sleep state is the real cause, the causal form. That's why the Upanishad explains. Deep sleep of Sushupti is a causal form. Because there is only agrahanam, absence of knowledge of the reality. There is no projection of wrong objects. Because in deep sleep, you don't see anything. There is complete absence of duality. Not because you transcend duality, but because the instruments with which you experience duality are not active. In the, in the Advaita tradition, all the indriyas, mind, everything get merged in the original ignorance called Mula Vidya. Everything gets merged in Mula Vidya. That is the commentator's description of the reason for this. Why? Because our, our ability to see, to hear all get completely benumbed in deep, deep sleep or Sushupti state. And so it's clear now. Uh, uh. Yes, yes. So you can't realize God in, in the sleep state or the deep sleep state. You can only yeah. realize God in the waking state. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. Could you talk about that? Yes. You know, in fact, in meditation or when you med meditate, when you practice spiritual sadhana in waking state, uh, an, an ideal aspirant should try to. Um, Thing of the witness of the reality which is present in waking state, in dream state, and also deep sleep state. And then he will realize these states are just project, they are all illusory. Only the experiencer is the real. Drishya, what you call drishya means experiences together, are unreal because they are changing, they are not the real experiences because there is a though there is similarity there are differences between both the waking and dream experiences so where there is change it cannot be eternally true so the spiritual aspirant should think of the reality of the witness who is present in waking state but who is not attached to any of the experiences of waking state and which is present in dream state again without any attachment to dream experiences, and who is present in Sushupti state as well. This is the this is what Upanishad says. So, as, as states, the three are equally unreal. And that's how an aspirant proceeds in meditation. When he thinks of the Sakshi or the witness, the experiencer, who is present in all the three states, then he starts thinking of the reality which is present in all the three states 
but it is not limited by all the three states. It is present in all the three states because it's beyond all the three states. If it is limited by any of the three states, it can be present only in one state. The very fact the reality is present as witness as Akshi in all these three states, Jagrit, Sopma and Sushupti states, shows that it is present in all the three states, but also it is beyond all the three states. So it's called Turiya. That's how an aspirant practices. It's called Sakshi Bhava. Sakshi means awareness plus detachment. Audasinyatvam and Bodhrutvam. Complete awareness should be there. Otherwise, uh, without awareness, we have Sushipti state. So Sakshi means the state where you, when you are completely aware of what is going on. At the same time, you are detached. So these two should combine. That is the real Sakshi experience. Bodhrutvam and Audasinyatvam means perfect awareness and detachment. In Sushupti, we are not aware of it, though we are free from duality. But uh, any experience uh, which without awareness uh, will not have any effect. Because unless you know what you know, your knowledge won't make any sense. We should know what we know, then only our knowledge makes sense in ordinary fashion. The same is say, applies here also. Yes, in uh, the Winship tells us there are only two factors present in dream experience. One is uh, as Turiya, the Atman is present as Drashta, as experiencer, uh, plus mind. Mind is present because everything is Manakalpidam, everything is projected by mind. So mind is present, but Indriyas are not present. When indriyas are present, it is called sthula or gross. When indriyas are absent, it is called subtle. Another reason, and for another criterion for deciding whether it is subtle or gross is, when it is panchikrita, it is gross. When it is apanchikrita, it is subtle. That, of course, that uh, we'll describe that later. Contemplation, that subject is a bit elaborate. It needs more time for explaining. Okay. When it is panchikrita, it is gross. Sthula, when it's apanchikrita, it is subtle. So in dream, everything um, is experienced in its apanchikrita state. That means uh, they, they are not uh, differentiated. The way they are differentiated in the panchikrita state is sthula experience. But everything is experienced internally. There is no more time. I will sell perhaps a little more time. Any other subject for? Oh, yes. Anyatha grahanam. Grahanam means cognition, understanding, perception. Anyatha means otherwise. And the other one means, means absence of grahanam. Absence. Uh, when you add I, it becomes the opposite meaning. I, I means there is there is a complete absence of perception or cognition of our true nature. Is that equivalent to uh, avarana and Yes. In fact, agrahana is related to avarana, and anyatha grahana is related to vikshepa. Uh, without avarana, without absence of true knowledge, there cannot be false knowledge or false perception. Without absence of correct perception, you cannot have wrong perception. So, any other? Otherwise, we'll continue. <coughs>
ാൽ സാക്ഷി who sees all these objects then he also realizes that i am the one who experiences the same objects in a subtle form as in dream as tajasa i am i am the one who remains the prajna who enjoys the bliss of deep sleep in susupti all these experiences all this knowledge are interrelated that means anyone who realizes the true nature of any of these three states will realize that i am the one the sakshi the witness the ever witness who is in no way related to the the the, the, the drishyas means the external objects or internal objects Vedanta will tell you if you can explain, if you can understand the true nature of even the most insignificant things that you see in nature, you are a knowledge of, you are an over a Brahman. That is the meaning of Sarvaknya means. Sarvam here means Brahman. Sarvam does, Sarvaknya means, it doesn't mean a man who knows everything in this world. Driving, eating, cooking, swimming, not that way. sarvam yasmat jatam iti tat sarva means that which is the source of everything that is the meaning of sarvam so if you know if you are no if you if you know the true nature of anything even the most insignificant object in this world then you are sarvajna in other way in i shall this i shall explain this in the light of the the well known analogy a stock example you know uh reju sarpa there is a piece of reju in front of you piece of rope in front of you 50 people assembled here have got 50 ideas as to what that object is because there is not enough light so 50 or 100 of you 100 people 100 people assembled here may have 100 different ideas as to what that object is if one of them really understands that his wrong understanding his his was the wrong understanding or what he really understood was wrong actually it is something other than what he thought it is then what will he understand he will understand his rope only if he think it is a stick or a snake and if you 
get rid of the that notion the wrong notion that it is snake then what notion will you have you will have its rope only so anyone who actually understand the true nature of world is also a knower of brahman but knowing the true nature of the jagat is not different from knowing for knowing the true nature of brahman because the moment you understand brahma satyam then you will understand jagat mithya from a philosophical point of view from an experience point of view <coughs> the moment you understand the brahman is only reality then you will also understand what you mistook to be jagat as something independent of brahman is in fact brahman only so na surupa drishtya brahma eva that side of it naam roopa drishtya brahma satyam jagat mithya surupa drishtya brahma satyam jagat satyam that side of it <coughs> so now i have an announcement to make we will not have class next friday may 25 because of the may retreat at ulima the next class will be on friday june 1st please remember there will be no class next friday may 25 the next class on monday ke obanisha will be on friday june the 1st ओम सहनाव सहनो 